How will you cook your food in a power outage? I'm Jonathan. And I'm Kylie. And we are the Provident Preppers. Today we are going to discuss my very favorite topic in newbie prep step number seven. Now that you have an emergency food supply, how are you going to cook it if the power goes out? In this video, we are going to explore some of the many ways that you have to get that job done. You need to be able to safely cook indoors as well as outside. And we're going to talk about how to safely store that fuel. Now, we're going to expose you to a whole lot of options, but make sure that you check the description of this video because we've created a lot of posts and videos on exactly how to specifically use some of these different devices. Let's go. Welcome to prep step number seven. We're going to talk about emergency cooking. You have food. Now, how are you going to cook it? Up to this point, we have six other prep steps and let's go through them really quickly. The first one that we did was to create our personal risk evaluation. And then we developed a family emergency plan so that we know exactly how to take care of our family when disaster strikes. Then we talked about emergency sanitation, how important this is. And we created our emergency evacuation kit so that regardless of what happens, we are ready to evacuate at a moment's notice. And of course, let's not forget about water. Water is one of the most important things you can have. And then we worked on building our short-term food supply. So now, I think you're ready to cook it. And yes, it is true. We are crazy. For the entire month of November, we accepted a grid down cooking challenge. And so we could not use any of our normal cooking devices. Nothing that was powered by electricity or natural gas for the entire month. Including Thanksgiving. We cooked a large Thanksgiving dinner for our guests. And you can check out the weekly videos that we created on our playlist, Grid Down Cooking Challenge. But one of the things that you might want to pay special attention to is that at the end, in our Grid Down Cooking Lessons, Jonathan, my wonderful geeky engineer husband who loves to attach a number to everything, actually tracked the amount of fuel that we used to cook during this challenge for the entire month. And so it's got some really good data and some of the great lessons that we learned. So make sure that you check out that grid down cooking lessons video. Now it's my job to be the safety monitor. Safety is the first and most important priority. Make sure that you don't take chances and do the other things that you need to do to make sure that you can safely cook. The one thing that we would highly encourage you to purchase is a portable carbon monoxide alarm that has a digital readout so that you can monitor any level of carbon monoxide that you may be introducing into your home. So prep step number seven, we're going to develop a plan. We're going to learn how to cook indoors and outdoors and how to safely store fuel. The first thing we're going to talk about is fuel conservation. And the reason why is because not very many of us have the ability to safely store large amounts of fuel for emergency use. So the less fuel that we use, the less fuel we need to store. We're going to introduce you to a really fantastic concept called retained heat cooking. If there is one thing that you take away from this video, it's retained heat cooking. It's also known as thermal cooking, hay box, straw box, insulated cooker, retained heat cooker, fireless cooker, or wonder oven, wonder box, or wonder cooker. It's all the same concept. The basic principles of retained heat are that you can only do certain foods. You have to have liquid in that food. So you can do it with a soup, a stew, um, a chili, something like that, but it's not gonna work for a roast. And the reason why is because when you bring that up to a boil, even if there's a lot of liquid around the roast, the center of that roast is cool and it's going to cool the entire pot. So anything that you do needs to be cut into these um, smaller pieces, but you, you're going to bring it to a complete boil and heat it all the way through. Then put on a tight fitting lid and then you want four in inches at least of insulation on all sides. And remember air is the enemy so you don't want any gaps. In this case where we're using this ice chest, the blanket is taking care of any air gaps. And then no peaking because if you lift that lid, you have released valuable heat and you're not going to be able to recoup that. There are great commercial thermal cookers on the market. Uh, Nissan makes one, there are others. There are also knockoffs that are not so good. Just make sure you're getting quality. And the really cool thing about this is that 
um, it's very convenient. So you see that pot that we're putting inside the thermal cooker. We put that on the stove and bring it up to the boil and then just set it in there. After we've closed the lid, I usually wrap this in a small blanket or towel because this is rated for about six hours, but I need it to stay insulated longer than that. And just by wrapping a blanket around it, or if we're traveling somewhere with it, we put it in a box with a blanket inside and then wrap that around there. But increasing that insulation, even with a commercial thermal cooker, makes all the difference. And recently we had a comment from one of our viewers who talked about problems in their country where you cannot even purchase a thermos now because fuel is so limited and thermoses have become a really hot item because you can use just these wide mouth stainless steel thermoses as a thermal cooker. You can also make expedient retained heat cookers by using something like an ice chest and blankets. This works just as well. And then if you're going to get creative, you can make some of these homemade retained heat cookers. And what this is, they're, they're like pillows that are full of styrofoam beads. And you want to make sure whatever you put inside is washable because you will have a lot of moisture released and over time it will start to smell. These that are full of that um, styrofoam beads, you can just toss them in the washing machine and let them air dry and then they're ready to go again. And one of the truly amazing things is when you combine this retained heat cooking with a pressure cooker, you have a very efficient system. And pressure cooking saves so much fuel. So I strongly encourage you to make sure that you're adding pressure cooker to your cooking arsenal. You have to be careful with pressure cookers and you can't just use them over an open fire. Men Grills actually makes a camp pot that is a pressure cooker that you can use directly on an open fire. So these are really cool. We have a video that we created on this. So if you want to research that, you can learn more about that. But if you go to mengrills.com and use the promo code Provident, they'll give you 10% off. So now let's talk about some fuel and cooking devices. Solar cooking is absolutely my favorite. Uh, my wife and I don't also always agree on this, but if I could only have one item, I would have the solar cooker because where we are, we could use that almost every day. At least 300 days a year, we could use a solar cooker. And the reason I don't agree is not that it's not a fantastic tool. It's that I can't use it in the dark. I can't use it on a cold um, winter day when there's lots of cloud cover or in the middle of a snowstorm. And so I definitely think this is something that we should have, but I don't know about the number one. Yeah, so. and, that, and that's okay because we're all different and we're all going to choose different things. So with the sun oven, you want a UV index of 7 or higher. Now, you're not always going to have that. But temperature is not always a significant factor. You can see that we're solar cooking in the middle of winter. There's snow on the ground and it's 10 degrees outside, but we had strong sun that day and it worked out really well. And one of the things that I have found about solar cooking is that the food turns out beautifully. Yesterday, um, it's summer here right now, and I didn't want to heat up the house by cooking, baking bread inside the house. And so I baked both cinnamon bread and some everything bagel bread in the sun oven outside. And it's just like this miracle because you just put it in there and you close the lid and it toward the sun and you come out later and it's cooked without using any fuel except for the energy of the sun. And lucky for me, it's a lot harder to burn something in the sun oven than it is in the regular oven. And going back to our cooking challenge, so these photos were taken when we were doing our 30 day grid down challenge. And you can see there's a turkey in there. And it's, we have a few sun ovens because one just isn't enough for our family. But what I've done here is I put a towel in the bottom of the sun oven because it does get a little bit juicy in there and um, the first time I caused some damage. So I put something to sop that up in there. And then that's an oven safe bag. And it it's just amazing that you can actually accomplish this. This is another solar option. It's not nearly as nice. It's the solar funnel cooker. And there's plans for this on our website. This will do a great job. What we have here is, in this case, just a, a car visor that was uh, turned into a funnel. We have a oven safe bag that you would cook a turkey in. Inside that bag is a two quart mason jar that has the outside spray painted black with... Barbecue spray paint. It's a high temperature spray paint and it's flat. We don't want it to be reflective. This as I mentioned, isn't quite as convenient, but it still does a great job on a budget. Okay, and John's a big fan of this. I think it's important you understand the principles behind this, right? Right. So that you can create it expediently. 
However, um, bread does not turn out pretty in this jar, right? And it, it's a lot of work. And if you put that jar in the dishwasher, all your dishes will be speckled. Black. A absolutely. Because yep. I do these things and so, I shouldn't. So this is really good for soups and stews and all kinds of things like that. Not as good for bread. I disagree. I think the other side of it is much better. Oh, I agree. <laughs> I totally agree. All right. So let's talk about candles. Now, you'd be amazed. These little tea lights, the reason why we want to talk about them is because a lot of times somebody might not be able to either afford the device um, or have the room to store it. If you live in a small apartment and you need to prepare for an emergency, but you can't store fuel outside, you really might want to consider the tea lights. They have, each tea light, depending on which where you get them and what kind they are, they'll burn for about four hours. Um, and in this picture, we're cooking just a pot of oatmeal, right? You, it's not a real hot rolling boil kind of thing. It It warms it and it simmers it, but that's about it. The closer that you have the pot to those tea lights, the hotter it's gonna be. Now, I did have one of our viewers tell us that her mom would put tea lights on a baking tray inside the oven, and then on the next rack up, she would cook bacon and eggs just using the tea lights in her oven. So this can be a very valuable resource. We d made a video on it, so you might wanna check that out, Emergency Fuel Candles. They're safe to store. You can store so many in just one gallon or one five gallon bucket. Alcohol does have an indefinite shelf life if it's stored in an airtight container. So that is a real plus for alcohol. In one of our videos, we did a comparison of different kinds of alcohol fuels. We used denatured alcohol, we used Everclear, isopropyl, and Safeed. You can see the relative prices on these. The Everclear burns wonderfully well, but it is expensive. The denatured is probably a good midpoint, as is the safe heat. The isopropyl, don't really recommend it. It's got a sooty flame. It kind of stinks and just doesn't burn as well or as hot. Yeah, so go to the video. We'll leave a link in the description um, so you can watch the video or read the post on this. But if you notice, we have that carbon monoxide detector in the background. And even though we burned a lot of fuel this day, um, it's still never registered any level of carbon monoxide, and that's one of the really big perks to alcohol. Alcohol is usually burned in a little alcohol stove, and you can see what happens is you just dump the alcohol in the center, and it's not actually the liquid that burns, it is the fumes that burn. One of the things you have to be really careful of is because alcohol burns so clean, it is possible that it will be lit and burning, and you won't actually see that flame, and you could burn yourself, so just be really careful. We like to use the alcohol burners and the safe heat in this little sterno stove. It just works really well. It folds down flat and it's pretty sturdy. The one on the other side here is a military grade stove and it also does a good job. Safe heat is probably my favorite and my number one recommendation for somebody other than the sun oven. If you, if this is only all I could have, I would have some safe heat. And the reason why is because I can safely burn it indoors. Now this is not the same thing as regular sterno. Um, it is a six hour chafing dish fuel. It is intended to be used inside and it, it's just really safe. Now it is an alcohol, right? So it's not gonna burn as hot as other fuels like propane, but um, definitely a, a real plus. There's also a video, Safe Indoor Cooking, where we talk about different ways to cook safely indoors and that's something you definitely wanna check out. One of the reasons why I like Safe Heat so much is because you can purchase it in these flats. And each one of these flats has about 72 hours of burn time, which is fantastic. And they're safe to store indoors. So you could store this in your pantry and then you've got this safe fuel for when you need it. The other thing that we want to point out here is that it could be a cooker or a heater. Um, by putting a small terracotta pot on the top of this folding camp stove and covering the little hole with something like aluminum foil and then a larger one over the top, you can have a nice little radiant heater using the safe heat. Um, it's not gonna create any more heat in the room because you have used the safe heat in the pots. What it does is it just um, kind of condenses it all to this one area so you have a good place where you can warm your hands and be warm. Most people are very familiar with propane. It is a great fuel. It burns hot, it's very dependable. It works well in cold weather and it stores for a very, very long time. But the thing you have to remember about propane is it is heavier than air. 
If you're using this indoors and it leaks, it's going to just find a nice low spot to hang out until there's an ignition source. Now that is different than natural gas because natural gas is lighter than air. It will just dissipate up and out, but the propane is different in that regard. So you have to make sure you use it carefully. And there's all sorts of cool devices that you may be using on a regular basis that if you're storing propane, you could use it in the event of emergency. And one of those is a propane barbecue. Another option is a portable propane camp stove. You do need to make sure you're using this outside because it is not rated for indoor use. This is one of my favorite things. You can tell just by looking at it. It is so beat up. But this little camp chef sits on my patio all year long. Um, we do our canning on it. We cook on it, especially during the summertime when I don't want to heat up my kitchen. Um, we just use this all the time and it performs really well. This was something new that we got for our cooking challenge. And it was really kind of fun because one of the things with emergency cooking is ovens are not usually available, right? A lot, you have a lot of stovetop options, but not oven options. And we really like the fact that this one had a little oven. Now, um, one of the problems with it was it's kind of the height because we put it up on this cart and we were using it in the garage and ventilating it appropriately. But your pot that you were cooking is kind of high up. So we had to have a little step stool to cook on it. So you might need to play with that just a little bit, but what a great device. One thing we like about the propane is the fact that you can just go get these bottles refilled fairly readily. This may not be the case in an emergency, but if you have some stored, then you've got that fuel to take care of your family. Charcoal briquettes can be a fantastic emergency cooking fuel. And we have an entire video on that um, and a post, so you might want to go to that. But it's very inexpensive and it stores really safely. It has an indefinite shelf life. But one of the drawbacks is that it produces a lot of carbon monoxide and that is deadly. So don't ever, ever, ever use these inside your home. Storing charcoal briquettes is super easy. We like to just store it in buckets. The buckets do not have to be food grade. In fact, the bucket on the left is actually a laundry detergent bucket that we the lid doesn't snap back on tight. So what we did is we fill it with charcoals and then we actually use a little bit of caulk and caulk that lid down so that it's airtight because moisture is your enemy for charcoal. If you try and um, start charcoal that has obtained moisture, you're just not going to be able to do it. You can dry it out, right? You can put it out in the sun, but it, that just means that you have to make sure you have a sunny day and that you have the time and ability to do that. It doesn't work well in an emergency. These little chimney charcoal starters are wonderful. They work really well. You can use newspaper underneath to get that started. You can use some lighter fluid. We even use the safe heat and put that underneath and get those charcoals going and that works really well. It's so nice with the safe heat because I just light that can and stick it under there. There's no blowing, there's no tending, it just works. This is an Apple Box charcoal reflector oven and it's a very inexpensive way to use charcoal to bake food. You need a rack um, and some people put little pop cans underneath the corners to hold up the rack. In my case, I'm married to an engineer husband who made sure that I had something created just exactly the right size for this. But we put an inverted cookie sheet on the bottom and that helps with fuel efficiency because that way the charcoals aren't actually resting on the cold surface. But it only takes 10 to 14 charcoals to bake around 350 degrees for up to 45 to 55 minutes. And in this case, these were um, frozen burritos that we had poured enchilada sauce over. This is a little bit different version. It's a paper box charcoal reflector oven. And this is the kind of box that um, reams of paper come in. And with both of these box, you have to have plenty of ventilation so that um, there's airflow because otherwise the charcoal can't burn. But this is a smaller pan. Usually what we do is we have a nine by 13 pan that's turned the other way and it sets just perfectly in this box. But the reason why this box is nice is because it only takes eight to 10 coals to bake at 350 and for a longer period of time. And so you're saving more fuel and that's what it's all about, right? We've got to make the best use of the fuel that we have. So make sure that you click on the link if you want to know how to make this box. Of course, Dutch oven cooking is a great way, and a lot of people, this is a hobby, but it's also a great preparedness tool. And this is a cool commercial device. It's called a cob cooker, and 
it has a little basket in there where you put the lit charcoals and you can use it to make hamburgers. In this case, it has this little skillet that comes with it. So you could fry different foods on it and use it as a skillet top. Um, I really like it because it's so energy efficient. The drawback for me is that I have a large family and this is good for feeding two or three people, but that's about it. This is a rocket stove and we can use it a couple different ways. We can put the wood in it, which you'll see in a little while. But in this case, we are actually just have lit charcoals in there and we're using it to cook these beans. We have a video, cool charcoal cookers that you might wanna check out that just goes through some of the different um, tools that you can use to cook charcoal. In the video, we just rebuke some of the cool tools that you can use when you want to cook with charcoal. Butane is another excellent fuel. The thing I really like about this is it gets right with the program. It gets hot in a hurry and you're cooking quickly. The operation is simple. Um, some of these are not rated for indoor use, so make sure that you get one that is rated for indoor use, but it is a great tool, especially in a short-term power outage. Now, I have to admit that before our grid down cooking challenge, I was not a real big fan of this because, um, well, there's several different reasons, but we found one that is made by Sterno that's actually a catering stove. And so you don't have to use it outside, right? Most of the camping butane stoves, they are outside use or you have to ventilate. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to have lots of windows open so you could use something inside. Then when I was living with this, you know, and I had to cook every day and we were still on this normal schedule, man, I fell in love with the butane stove. And so we created a video about it and it goes into great detail, but it's um, butane stove power outage. It'll kind of go through all the details we don't have time to share with you right now. The biggest drawback for me with the butane stove is that you have all these little canisters, right? Um, it, the fuel's expensive and storing them, they're like little bombs. So you have to be really careful um, where you store them and it's not sustainable. Once you are out of the fuel, it's just not gonna work. Coleman fuel is another option that you have. It has a shelf life of about five to seven years if it's not been opened. Uh, and it burns very hot, even at cold temperatures, but it does produce carbon monoxide. You have to be very careful. This cannot be used in your house. And remember, I just want to reinforce that because when we first started prepping years and years ago, I called my county extension agent and said, what do you recommend for people during a power outage to use? And he said, well, I just bring my Coleman stove in and put it on my kitchen counter. That is so dangerous because carbon monoxide is a silent, deadly enemy. This is a great tool, but you need to use it in a ventilated area outside of your home. Kerosene is a good fuel. It's fairly inexpensive. It's less explosive than gasoline or Coleman fuel. It also has a five-year shelf life, probably plus a little bit, and you can extend that with some stabilizers. It is something that you need to use in a ventilated area. It does produce carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. So this isn't something that you should be using in your home. I know that there's a lot of people who, who are using kerosene indoors and especially kerosene heaters. Um, I would just caution you to be very careful. When I first started, I made a lot of mistakes, right? And these are some wick um, type kerosene stoves that we have. And I had taken one of these and put it on the kitchen counter and started to cook dinner using the kerosene. I thought, oh, you know, this is great. It smells a little bit, but, it, but this is awesome. And then my little guy who has a history of asthma started just really suffering and coughing and wheezing. And we forget that it's not just the carbon monoxide that the kerosene produces. There are other toxins. So outside, great. In my home, it, there's just not a place for it in my home. Um, just be really careful with whatever you choose to do and practice with it so you make sure that it is okay for you and your family. Wood is a great cooking option. This is a simple over the fire camp grill. And quite frankly, I think everybody should have that because for emergencies, you never know where you're going to end up or how you're going to be able to cook. And you could take this little rack and cook over any open fire. And so that that's a great plus. They're less than 20 bucks, so something great to invest in. Kelly Kettle makes a wonderful emergency cooking device. The thing that I really like about it is that there is a water jacket. So you see the little orange stopper? You pour the water in that and then you just set it over the base and it very quickly 
brings the water to a boil and it's in a place where you can't get any outdoor contaminants blowing into it. Um, we also see it's kind of like a little rocket stove where you put the sticks in there and we've cooked hamburgers and all kinds of things on this little stove. Again, this is just small. It's not going to feed my entire family, but it's got some great benefits. I think it's both available in aluminum and stainless steel. Ours is stainless steel. And this is my baby. It is the result of us having a challenge where we went without power in the middle of January. And I swore that I would never be that cold again. And so um, before our house was even finished, this was delivered and put inside. And the thing I like about it is I can cook on the top. It has an oven and it also has a water reservoir, which make it perfect for um, any type of emergencies in the wintertime. But it's going to be super lousy in the summertime. Not even an option to really use this to cook Hence in the summertime. Hence the sun oven. Hence the sun oven. <laughs> and this is that same biomass rocket stove that we showed you earlier that we were using with charcoal. This is how it's used as a rocket stove where you're just feeding the little sticks into it. Um, the really nice thing is that it's very energy efficient by just producing a lot of heat using just a few sticks. This is a Bear River rocket stove with a large grill on top and a large oven. For our Thanksgiving dinner, this is how we did it. There was the turkey on the inside and we cooked the pies. We did a lot of cooking on the top. It just does a great job. There's three rockets that fire this, two for the grill and one for the oven. And they all contribute to make just a crazy cool rocket stove. Yeah, and there's a little backstory about this. So when we did our cooking challenge, we um, called Dan at Bear River Rocket Stove because we knew we couldn't afford one of these. And we just asked if we could just borrow it for a month. So, you know, it'd be good for him. He'd get some publicity and I'd get to use it. Well, when the cooking challenge was over, I told John he couldn't take it back. I said, we have to buy this stove because it's just so good, you know, for a lot of people. And some of our neighbors who saw it also said, did you buy it? Did you buy it? Because we want to be able to come and cook some of our food when a disaster happens, and right? that's the really cool part about this is we could. We can fire this thing up and all our neighbors can bring their stuff and we can cook a massive amount of food and feed the whole neighborhood. Yeah, all work together. Ah, this is something totally cool that I had never seen before. Um, it's a masonry heater and we are actually getting one installed, what, tomorrow? Yep. Tomorrow. So this is our new excitement. We were not that familiar with masonry heaters until Derek and Patrick reached out to us. Uh, they own Tempcast and they talked to us about these heaters and we are having one installed in our outdoor building this week. It's really funny because we hadn't heard about it and so when somebody reaches out to us, we got to make sure that it's good right before we invest that kind of money into doing something. And we found somebody locally who had one and went and visit. Actually, he has two. He has one upstairs and one downstairs. And we went and visited him and saw it working. And he lives off grid. And he was telling us that he uses this to heat his home. Right. And was just incredibly impressed. So I'm right. so excited. One fire a day in each of those. And it keeps the whole house warm until the next time he lights the next fire the next day. So it's a great tool. But the cool part about this, or one of the cool parts about this, is the oven that's above it. And so this oven, after you burn this big burn, it's for about two or three hours, it's a pizza oven. And you can use it to cook pizzas and, and things that need that temperature. Then for three to five hours, you've got uh, 350 to 400 degrees as a regular oven that you can cook whatever in and then you can use it as a slow cooker uh, for another six to eight hours so it is a great emergency tool and we'll have more on this coming one of the beautiful things about the masonry heater is that it you know you can create it to be exactly what you want it to be and so watch for our videos that are going to come up on our creation because we've done some really fun fun things but if you go to timcast.com um, you can check out more about what they are doing. But if you use the promo code PROVIDENT, they'll give you $250 off. But what a great investment. Yes, it is. And how this works is it uses a lot of mass. A, a normal wood stove, that exhaust just goes up and out. This, it channels through all these, all this mass and warms it all. And that's what gets all that hot and keeps it hot and allows it to radiate through your home. And it produces hardly any smoke. That's right. I think that's the other thing is that your neighbors aren't all going to know that you're burning a fire because it burns so hot, it incinerates and it 
produces very little ash and very little smoke. There are a bunch of random cooking fuels that are out on the market, um, and we're gonna talk about just a few of those. These are the solid fuel cubes, and this is normally goes by the brand name of Esbit. There might be others out there. It creates a real intense heat up to about 1400 degrees, but it just burns for a short time. They are a little bit expensive, but they are very portable and something that you would maybe want to put in your backpack for your 72 hour kit. Uh, they do have a long shelf life and if nothing else, you might use it as a fire starter. You could just break off a little chunk of that and use it to get a fire going. Trioxane fuel bars are very similar. Um, this is a military grade pack and you just break off whatever size piece you're gonna wanna use and you put it in the little portable stove. One of the things that I thought was interesting about this is if you look at it after it's burned in that lower right hand photo, it's almost gone. There is practically no evidence at all that that, that little piece ever existed. Um, the gel fuel, same thing, military grade, you squeeze it out and you light it, um, but it leaves like these little styrofoam ball looking things. Okay, so I know that was like a fire hose flood of information. So I hope that, that you just sat back and just kind of soaked it in just a little bit because there's there's a lot to learn, but you don't have to know everything. And uh, you don't have to have all this stuff. Yeah. You need to choose one or two things that are going to work for you, and that's where the action plan comes in. Yeah. And so if you go to our website, theprovidentprepper.org, and on the main menu bar, you'll see action plans. Click on it, and it will take you to a page that has some icons on it that are shown over at the right. You're going to click on emergency cooking, and then it will bring you up to this page, this action plan. Click here for a PDF copy of the emergency action plan. That's where you want to click. And this isn't meant to be your list because we don't believe in lists. This is a, something to get the juices flowing, get the, the thoughts churning, and for you to figure out what's going to work for you and put it in your plan. When you pull up that PDF, this is what you're going to see. So it, it does refer you to our book, which you can totally, you don't need to have our book to be able to accomplish this at all. Um, but it kind of walks you through and talks about calculating different fuels. And so for instance, with the white rice, it'll, it talks about, okay, if you're using a liquid or a gas fuel, you know, this is how you do it with a Dutch oven. This is how you do it. Hay box. And so it's kind of fun that way. It's, I think it's really helpful. It gives you kind of a good idea. So this is the last page and this is where you're going to get this all down on paper. This is where you're going to decide what it is that's going to work for you. And then you get it on there and you've got your action plan and you're ready to go. And of course, as always, you have a reading assignment. So we will leave a link to each one of these in the description of this video because it, there's a lot of good background information that you, would be, just be really beneficial to you. And now you've got homework. Sorry, it's the consequence of watching the video. But once you've completed the reading assignment, you need to review the emergency cooking action plan and get together as a family and brainstorm whatever options you already have in place. Cause that's the, if you have a barbecue, let's start there, right? What would it require to make that barbecue able to help you cook in an emergency? Do you need to buy more fuel, right? Do you need to acquire maybe some other devices? Do you need to go and buy some safe heat and tuck it away somewhere along with the folding stove so that you've got what you need to cook your food when disaster strikes. And let's emphasize that an important part of this is the practice. So make sure that practice is part of your action plan. That's going to help you figure these things out and not make mistakes when you can't afford to make mistakes. Very soon you can watch for prep step number eight, which is emergency heating. This is a vital subject for those of you that live in cold areas and some of you that even live in hot areas that sometimes get cold. Uh, think about Texas. Can you see why I am such a fan of emergency cooking? If you are prepared and well practiced, it can be more of an adventure than a disaster. And now for the question of the day. What are your favorite ways to cook both inside and out during an emergency? Comment below. And thanks for being part of the solution.